Well, it's 10 o'clock and a little bit here in Ottawa. Thank you all for your attendance this morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you may be coming in. This morning, we're going to talk about physical security solutions and loss prevention for logistics centers. Kevin Thompson of Sensetero is going to lead us through that discussion. Kevin is a veteran product manager with Sensetero. He is responsible for multiple products, including the SendStar bin clients, the Symphony network video recorders, and the SendStar enterprise manager software. Kevin has a master's from Carleton University and an MBA from the Telfer School of Management at the University of Ottawa. And when Kevin is not managing his products and dealing with this, the security solutions of our customer base, he loves to coach football, and this is real tackle football, big boys hitting each other hard. So Kevin, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Stuart. And I guess uh, on that note, let's hit this presentation hard as well. So jumping in, the agenda that we're proposing to cover today, specific to challenges of warehouses and distribution centers. Uh, we're gonna look first at some of the unique challenges that we know uh, you're facing. We'd like to uh, have a discussion about quantifying risk in financial terms, particularly for people who uh, are in charge of putting together business cases. Uh, we're gonna look at some, some potential solutions that, that could be of assistance, and we're gonna ca categorize them in three ways. The, the first would, have, would be zero or very minimal impact on the existing physical infrastructure at the site. Uh, the second one is gonna be uh, a minimal impact on that physical infrastructure. And the third is, is more what we would characterize as a moderate impact. So uh, we're scaling up in terms of uh, the amount of impact uh, to the site. And then of course, the, the complexity and, and the depth and breadth of the potential solution. Stuart is gonna take us through some integration scenarios uh, with our technology. We'll, we'll have a bit of a wrap up and I'll encourage uh, question, questions and answers. So if we look at security challenges uh, for warehousing, distribution centers, logistics centers. Uh, when we look at perimeter security, uh, there are a number of unique things to consider. Uh, often warehouses are in remote locations, uh, making them uh, that much more difficult uh, to surveil. Uh, in certain, certain instances uh, where the warehouses are not remote, they might be in uh, high crime rate locations. We do have customers that are experiencing that today. For larger facilities, they have very, very long fence lines. And so that perimeter becomes uh, very extended and, and much more difficult to defend. And always a concern uh, with a lot of activity uh, in and out of facility that uh, individuals are authorized uh, to access a facility or to access different locations within the facility. In terms of internal security, uh, there is uh, always uh, a concern because of the of the large size, large square footage, large square meterage, uh, a lot of a lot of ground to cover. Uh, also, often massive inventories and constant activity, often 24 by 7 operations. Um, there are high value items to safeguard, both traditional uh, high value items and items that uh, you know might have gone up in value uh, in recent times. And then we also have the fact that in certain cases, the, the physical structure, the building walls and ceilings themselves tend to be vulnerable to, to physical intrusion. So, and, and unfortunately those, you know, those lost scenarios, those intrusions are happening. If we just look at some headlines that anyone could find from a Google search in the last 60 days, um, we do see that where these are known uh, to contain items of value and they're seen as targets, unfortunately, by uh, by miscreants who are are looking to you know to gain financially. If we look uh, and we come forward now and we start thinking about the financial impact of loss, what I wanted to take you through is a methodology that comes uh, from ISC squared. So that's the International Information System Security Certification Consortium. They're the ones responsible for the Certified Information Security Systems Professional Certification. And so this methodology, uh, you know, comes from a trusted third party, and it's a proven and accepted way of quantifying uh, risk and loss and also mitigation factors. So if we look uh, at uh, what we call 
a pre-safeguard annual loss expectancy. We're going to look at the asset value, uh, the exposure factor of that asset to loss, and what a single loss event might look like. We call that a single loss expectancy. Then we take that and we multiply that by how often it might happen in a year. We call that the annualized rate of occurrence, and that gives us the annualized loss expectancy. Once we quantified our risk in financial terms, we need to consider the investment to mitigate that risk. And so the investment may be comprised of hardware, software, services, integration, training of personnel, and maintenance contracts for that technology. When we make an investment from a financial perspective, we always want to consider the benefits. And so the benefits that we're seeking is to lower that exposure factor and lower the analyzed rate of occurrence which will in turn lower our, our annualized loss expectancy. So those are the benefits that we expect to derive uh, when we make that investment that's called the annualized cost of the safeguard. So when we look at our post-safeguard scenario, we again have the asset value, the exposure fact factor, and the single loss expectancy. Uh, what we're hoping and, what, and what, we, what we should be producing here from the investment is a reduction in exposure factor, as I said, and a reduction in likelihood of occurrence, which uh, then allows us to do an evaluation of the numbers where we take our pre-safeguard ALE and our post-safeguard ALE, and we deduct them from each other. We also deduct the cost of the safeguard or the, the cost of the security controls that we're going to put in place. And that helps us quantify the annual value of that investment to the organization. This methodology now, we look at a hypothetical example and we try and uh, introduce some numbers just for the sake of, of, uh, of demonstration. Here's a, here's a warehousing or a distribution entity. Um, we're looking at them with their pre-safeguard annual loss expectancy. Perhaps they've decided to stock uh, an item that's very popular now, the, the 3M uh, N95 masks. We see they come in... Uh, in uh, packages of 15. We see post COVID 19, that was worth about $35 a package. We'll, or sorry, pre COVID 19. Uh, right now, that package is, is inflated, maybe worth about $50 a piece. So now we have 10,000 of them in inventory. It gives us an asset value of $500,000. We, we uh, based on modeling or based on uh, you know, past occurrences or based on our guts, if we don't have data. We know that in a single loss event, we're not going to lose our entire inventory, but we're going to characterize our exposure, our exposure factor at 65% or 0.65. So that gives us a single loss expectancy quantified of $325,000. We, again, uh, perhaps we've suffered one loss so far. And if we project that forward uh, over a year or we look at similar uh, type of assets and how often they might be compromised, we are going to say that we have an annualized rate of occurrence of two, so two times per year, and we multiply that by the single loss expectancy, which gives us an annual uh, risk or an annual loss expectancy of $650,000. Then we look at the potential investment. So again, our investment is made up of hardware, software, services, training, maintenance, as we talked about. The financial total of that investment for the sake of this illustration is $75,000. And the benefits we're looking to derive is to reduce our exposure factor and our rate, annual rate of occurrence. So when we look at our post safeguard annual loss expectancy, that's what we see. We've reduced our exposure factor from 65% to 20%. So we recognize that it's near impossible to 100% eliminate your exposure factor. So what we're saying is we've drastically reduced it. We haven't eliminated it. But that does give us a single loss expectancy now of $100,000. And by the same token, with our safeguards that we put in place, we can now estimate that our, law, our rate of occurrence is going to be only a single time per year and not twice. So again, now our single, or sorry, our annualized loss expectancy has been reduced from $650,000 to $100,000. So when we do the evaluation, the math is not that difficult. Right, we have uh, $650,000 minus $100,000 while minus our $75,000 investment in technology gives us uh, a net 
of $475,000. So that's how we quantify. We can say the net benefit of this investment in year one, which we recognize that there are capital costs and there are also operational costs, but in year one, our benefit is to the tune of $475,000. So obviously, if this number were a negative, we're over-investing in the security controls or in the safeguards uh, when we consider them uh, in light of the value of the asset that we're trying to protect. In this case, we have a positive number and we have a good business case. And this might be a methodology that would be accepted by management to make an investment in technology and technology safeguards. So moving on, we're going to look now in our first scenario at uh, potential solutions that have the minimal impact on the existing physical infrastructure at the site. So when you when you talk about scenarios, I think it's important to state your assumptions. So our assumption here uh, for the customer situation is this. Uh, they have in place uh, existing security cameras or a CCTV system. They have the physical infrastructure to allow that in terms of cable plant, for instance, networking switches, POE, all that infrastructure is in place. They have a video recording server of some kind with a VMS or perhaps an MVR, uh, or maybe if it's dated equipment, it's a DVR. Uh, but they we are assuming that they have basic video view recording and playback functionality. So if it were a system like this, usually it has some limitations. Uh, it doesn't have a great deal of intelligence. Uh, configuration options may be limited. Uh, and we typically see this, either it has, uh, it has no alarm capability whatsoever, so you're, you're left uh, sifting and sorting through hours of video to find an event, or it, it may have limited uh, alarm capability, or it's going to have overwhelming number of alarm events where there's so many uh, that it's very difficult to find a needle in a haystack. In terms of workflow, there usually isn't much uh, that's uh, enabled through the system. And as we talked about, difficult to find specific individual events. So in our scenario, we're saying, why not leverage all that existing infrastructure and simply drop in a video analytics platform? That platform can execute in parallel to the existing solution as a dedicated analytics system, uh, generating alarms that can be action and integrated with workflow by on-site personnel. Uh, or simple integrations can be done through dry contact or an SDK integration. Or in the extreme case, if the prior system is just not up to the task, uh, it can be re uh, replaced in its entirety by keeping the existing camera and network infrastructure in place. Uh, the benefits in terms of functionality are a great deal of intelligence and automation around motion detection and tracking, more detailed configuration parameters, reliable alarm events, low false positives, some built-in workflow around alarms, and comprehensive capability uh, to for searching for individual events or linked events or cascading events and reporting within the system. So some concepts I just wanted to cover while we talk about video analytics uh, are server-based versus edge-based analytics. So for, the, for the purposes of our discussion today, we're going to be focusing entirely on server-based analytics that run on the server system itself and leverage the CPU and resources of the server. There are also edge-based analytics, and in fact, Sensor does offer a number of edge analytics that are going to execute on the camera themselves. Won't be discussing those in today's presentation. And then the, the idea of native resolution analytics. So in, in many cases, our analytics can run reliably at low resolution and low frame rates, which is great if you have uh, perhaps dated legacy infrastructure. Certain analytics, more advanced analytics like face recognition or license plate recognition do require higher resolution. So I just wanted to make sure we were clear about that. When we look at the Sensar uh, Symphony Analytics Suite, we have a large number of offers. And I'm, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. And we will look at some of them, um, I guess, in operational scenarios as we go through this presentation. So uh, analytics that we have include uh, automatic tracking for pan, tilt, zoom cameras, left and remove item detection, the ability to detect crowds in, in defined spaces, the ability to detect, record, and report on license plates in multiple uh, geographic regions, uh, face rec recognition, tampering of the infrastructure, so the camera or the single loss from the camera across the network, the ability track people both indoors and outdoors and outdoors vehicles as well 
And then we have uh, an interesting packaging of our analytics, which we call the core analytics pack. So in this case, uh, if you think you need analytics, but you're not certain of the particular use case, you don't need to choose when you buy. Uh, you can buy a single license that is going to activate or allow multiple use cases and then deploy on a per camera basis uh, based on your specific need. So here we have uh, what we had referred to already as the PTZ camera auto tracking. So if you have in place uh, an absolute positioning camera, uh, we can automatically calibrate that camera uh, within the analytics system and then have it automatically track and trace uh, people or items of interest in your environment, uh, capture those events, allow those events to be intelligently searchable and sortable and uh, obviously reported upon. Next analytic I'm looking at very quickly is something called crowd detection. So with the crowd detection analytic, we can define in a particular space occupancy and capacity and we can use uh, computer vision technologies uh, to estimate based on what's happening in the scene, where we are against the thresholds that we set. So this may be uh, particularly of interest in a COVID-19 world where we want to uh, limit and understand you know, how many people are in a particular space at any given point in time. With the uh, Sensor Symphony Analytics, we have uh, quite comprehensive out-of-the-box graphical uh, reporting and also heat map reporting uh, that helps you understand at any time what's going on with your analytics. So what we wanted to do is have a, a little bit of interactivity within uh, today's presentation. So we do have um, some polls that we're going to be presenting here at the end of each section. And so this brings us to the time for our first poll, which will be focusing, focusing on our first or our initial um, solution scenario. So I'm going to uh, bring that poll up now. What we're looking for is uh, just to get uh, kind of a taking the temperature of what people have in their environment when it comes to uh, VMS, video recording, CCTV, and analytics. So please do take, we'll say, about 30 seconds to uh, answer. And then what we'll do is we'll close the poll and we'll share the results. Okay, I'm seeing the vote. The votes coming in in real time, so I'm going to give just a few more uh, seconds for people, a lot of people, time to consider and vote. Okay, it looks like the voting activity has slowed down, so I'm going to close the poll. All right, we're at 48% uh, voter uh, turnout, so I'm going to close the poll. So uh, interesting results here, um, in the sense that uh, it seems like the largest answer is uh, people have in place today in our audience, anyway, in this sample. Uh, video management systems or CTV, CCTV systems that are only doing basic report, uh, recording, uh, which is useful in certain use cases, but usually pretty labor intensive with respect to uh, sifting and sorting through video and finding specific events and specific time frames. We see a, lo a low number, only 7% that are saying their system generates no alarms at all. Uh, we are seeing almost a quarter that have some kind of basic video motion detection analytics. Uh, but by the same token, we're seeing about 17% that are saying that systems are generating too many alarms. And we know that that scenario uh, makes it very difficult to know which alarms are real and which alarms are nuisance. And it affects our ability to be uh, effective in responding to alarms. And then we do have uh, a number of respondents, which is, which is really good to see, who do have what we would characterize as more advanced analytics, including tripwire, license plate recognition, and face, face recognition. So thank you very much, everyone who participated in the poll. Uh, this is very interesting information uh, for us all to share. So at this point, uh, I'm going to hand over uh, to my colleague, Stuart Dewar, and he's going to take us through this, uh, this next section. Thank you, Kevin. So now we're going to talk about some solutions that can help you with the theft prevention scenario with what we're characterizing as minimal physical infrastructure requirements, the installation of some internal sensors in the building. Basically, so if we have the scenario that we've been talking about, warehousing, storage centers, distribution centers, uh, with a lot of high value goods, they are a target, um, they're large, there's a lot of uh, area to cover, and there may be, in the particular point here, no or poor perimeter security. So potential intruders or thieves have direct access to the building structure to attempt 
uh, a wall breakthrough, um, you know, in, in that back part that's not well lit, you know, and we have a solution that can help with that by deploying a, a wall breakthrough detection with our system that we'll talk about in a second, the Flexon system. And of course, you can use complementary video analytics to also deal with this problem, you know, by using face recognition to detect intruders that might masquerade as employees, put on a put on a badge, walk around, pretend that they belong, or detect personnel in non-traffic areas, you know, that where there shouldn't be people or they shouldn't be there during off hours, we can use uh, the video analytics to help us with that. So our wall breakthrough solution that Tensor can offer is based on our FlexZone sensor. It can, as the picture to the lower right presents, it uses vibration-sensitive cable. Uh, that vibration-sensitive cable can be deployed on the walls, it can be deployed on the ceilings, it can be deployed on interior walls, floors, you know, wherever the threat direction is, we can deploy the, the cable. Detects intrusions of almost any kind, you know, drilling, sawing, hammering, you know, smashing through, and it will also determine where that intrusion is happening. Not just that something is happening somewhere, it tells you fairly accurately where that is happening. And that information then can be sent to the, the video management system or security management system that's managing the overall security of, of the site. Uh, the solution can deal with almost any material, you know, concrete, sheet metal, brick, wood, metal, and basically, the key point is that the system is vibration sensitive. These kind of intrusions, breakthroughs, create substantial vibration, you know, focused at a point. And that's very different than your normal background. You know, walls, ceilings, floors don't generally vibrate that much, you know, at a, at a focus point. And that's the sort of theory of operation of the system that gives us a high probability of detecting these kind of break, breakthrough events, such as this picture on the lower left illustrates. Here's a little bit, bit more about the FlexZone solution. A uh, picture here of what the processor looks like. You know, that's the controller for the solution. Uh, simple visual of, you know, the sensor cable being deployed on a, in this case, a secure stockroom cage. And on the right-hand side, we have some visuals for to illustrate the integration options that come with the system. And the simplest thing is in the above here where you can deploy the flex zone in the breakthrough, uh, wall breakthrough mode and get use the relays directly from the processor, tie that into your alarm panel that, that's in your system, do alarm activations, tie it into your SMS, VMS, very, very simple deployment. In a larger center where you're deploying more of the flex zone processors, it's very convenient to use the built-in communications uh, facility that that sensor cable supports, that the FlexZone system supports, so that we only need to tie into one or two for redundant app purposes to an interface device, to our integration software that then integrates to the overall site, VMS, SMS, PSIM, what have you. So flexible stages of integrating the solution. Just a very quick illustration of what we're talking about materially to provide it to the solution. So if you imagine a fairly sizable facility, 40,000 square meters or 430,000 square feet, you're going to have about walls 660 feet by 660 feet. You're going to have walls that are probably up to 30 feet high, so you're going to need two passes of cable to get the necessary coverage. Your, the material of your solution will look like this. Four flex zone processors in this, in this example, network cards to go into the processor to allow you to tie that processor into the, the Ethernet IP network in the building. Uh, the cable, armored cable in this case recommended, and then the cabling accessories that allow you to join the cable segments together and um, terminate the cable, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what your solution is going to look like for that for that scenario. Then we can go back and look how we how the video 
can augment that wall breakthrough detection system. And Kevin's going to go take us through that. So this is our indoor people tracking analytic, and it's quite flexible. It has a lot of different use cases that it can cover. Uh, what we can do is use a motion mask to actually define a particular area when it, within the camera's scene, uh, field of view, where we're interested uh, in in tracking uh, motion and events that might happen, and we understand that certain areas in the camera's field of view might not be of interest. So it's it's quite flexible in the ability to define that. Uh, we also track direction of flow, and we can count people and then do uh, virtual tripwire use cases. And in fact, we'll look at that in the next slide. So here we have a, a virtual trip, tripwire uh, that's, uh, in this case, in a retail setting, uh, tracking people uh, coming in and, and leaving the location. This same uh, mechanism could be used to track wrong, wrong way. So in a location where we only want people going a particular direction, we can now track if they're uh, obviously going the wrong way. And in a, in a warehouse or distribution facility, if we want to track personnel, uh, how many personnel have gone into a particular location, perhaps it's restricted access, uh, or perhaps in the 19, we need to uh, keep under a certain number, we can use the analytic to automate that function and feed into our workflow within the facility. Face recognition is a very interesting analytic. It's uh, you know one of the more advanced analytics and one of the more uh, CPU intensive from a processing perspective. So. What we can do is actually uh, register within the system a template of faces of persons of interest. And then uh, with a higher resolution video camera, we can now um, capture those faces, correlate back to our template, and be, be able to then uh, trigger alarms, do uh, allow or deny lists, uh, be able to track uh, the location of those personnel, or do video verification in conjunction with access control system. Um, using the face as the identifier. With the object removed and left, left behind analytic, again, you see it here more in a transportation setting. We can uh, focus the camera on a particular location and then detect in the instance where an item is either removed that should be there or an item is left behind um, and that's, that's noteworthy. So if we uh, think about that in a warehousing uh, scenario, there may be locations in the warehouse where waylaid packages usually end up uh, or within a field of view of a camera that you want to track an, an alarm on, report on, and then integrate into workflow. Uh, at the same, uh, by the same token, there may be uh, items that are going to fall off a, a conveyor belt in a large, uh, in a large warehouse where you have you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of items moving uh, at all times, day and night. So again. It gives you the ability to automatically detect that scenario. So this brings us to, to the end of section two, and we do have another poll, if people will be so kind as to uh, participate with us. I'll bring up that poll now. So these questions are obviously pertinent to the subjects covered in this section. So now we're going to move into another segment where we're talking about <clears throat> solutions that require a step up in terms of what you what you're willing to install from a physical infrastructure impact, and we're talking specifically about outdoor perimeter solution uh, intrusion solutions. So again, we have that same scenario: the high value warehouse uh, storage. Uh, center, what have you, um, large, long fence line, poor lighting, all the same scenarios that we had before. But this time we're going to look at deploying fence mounted perimeter detection to A, either get an extra level of security at the edge, so to speak. Uh, B, maybe that's necessary because there are assets in addition to what's in the actual building structure, you know, equipment, trucks. Uh, uh, what have you. And to solve that, we have some different technologies that we can put on the fence, including um, including an integrated detection and lighting solution that has some very interesting uh, benefits associated with that. All of the solutions give you good detection, accurate location, and they all have potential 
good integration to the um, DMS SMS. And in terms of the infrastructure impact, we're talking about now putting sensor cable on the existing fence. And associated with that is likely, often you may need to do some trenching across entrance ways, um, et cetera. So that's the, that's the scale of the, the solution um, infrastructure impact that we're talking about. And again, the video analytics can obviously be a, a, a important additive layer to the outdoor uh, security uh, solution. So looking at the solution, so again, uh, in the picture, you know, we have the target to be defended, so to speak, you know, the warehouse, and then we're going to take advantage of this fence that's protecting that facility to get that detection at the perimeter. So what do we need to do? We need to have coverage over different types of, of fencing. We need to scale to meet different site re sizes because we we have small to jumbo in terms of the sites that we're talking about. We need to be able to detect any kind of intrusion that's likely climbing, cutting, lifting, uh, dismantling of a, of a palisade style fence. Uh, we want that accurate detection, you know, so that we can pinpoint where things are happening. And we want, we want obviously the integration with the VMS SMS. And we have a range of solutions to offer for that. Here they are on the right hand side. We can offer our flex zone solution, the one that we talked about earlier, as a solution for wall breakthrough detection. We can put that on the fence, very effective in that environment. We have the SenseStar LM100 solution, combination detection and lighting, which I will not. Uh, go into any further at this moment. We'll wait to the next slide. Our fiber patrol solution, which is another fence sensor, which has the benefit of being completely EMI and lightning immune and require, requiring nothing on the fence other than fiber optic cable. And then we have the analytics that we can add to that through the VMS. So the FlexOn solution, that same solution that we talked about for the wall breakthrough can be applied on the fence. Um, any type of fence, uh, chain link, weld mesh, palisade style, what have you, uh, has the accuracy of plus or minus three meter detection, approximately 10 feet. And one of those boxes that's shown here can cover 600 meters, almost 2,000 feet of, uh, can activate almost 2,000 feet of sensor cable. And that cable can be broken down into up to 60 reporting zones because when we interface to the VMS or SMS we need to be able to say where things are happening not just that something is happening on a, on a mile long long perimeter and that's what we can do with this system quick point here um, what's new on this slide environmental specs so that box is uh, covers the full temperature range, it's designed to go outside, has the NEMA type 4X uh, rating, so it'll blast through up to 10 years in any, any kind of environment. And again, those in, same integration options that we uh, discussed before apply to the Flexon when used in the outdoor environment. Sensor LM100, this is our combination lighting, intrusion detection and lighting solution provides detection through an accelerometer in the what we call the luminaires. And obviously the lighting is in the luminaires. So the lighting is optimized for perimeter. It has a lighting pattern that gives focused light on the perimeter for the cameras. The lighting has an appropriate spectrum to give the best color rendition through in, in the cameras. And the lighting is programmable. You can schedule it to be off in the day, on at night. Uh, you have programmable levels of lighting and you can bright up on a pre-alarm as a deterrent. So if you have a camera, say, that's got some motion detection and you think, well, something is happening out there, bright up the lights and that is a deterrent and that itself could save, could, could avoid an, an incident. Fire patrol system is optimized really for longer sites. So if you have a large logistics center, or maybe you're concerned you're about a port or an airport, the fiber patrol solution, uh, the fiber patrol system is your solution for that environment. It handles sites of almost any size, up to 80 kilometers uh, with that one box. 
and again, it has that benefit of being EMI and lightning immune and needing nothing outside other than the, the power. So this slide just shows you, again, some idea of the, the scale and the relative simplicity, really, of the fiber, the flex zone solution for that fence-mounted solution. So if you had a typical warehouse, it's not so typical, but let's take a hypothetical warehouse where you have like 1,000 by 1 foot, 1,000 foot fence line, uh, this would be your solution. Three flex on processors can do that whole thing. Again, if we just presume that we're interfacing through network, through the Ethernet network, three network cards to make that happen, your sensor cable, cabling accessories, and then we have a wireless gate sensor that communicates wirelessly to the Flexon thing to enable effective detection on your gates, both, both swinging and sliding gates. And right to the solution. LM100 would be somewhat similar in the sense, but we're replacing the sensor cable of the Flexon system with the luminaires, approximately 200 for the same application type, and some low voltage, power cable to bring power to the luminaires from, from the nearest source available. And the luminaires take anything from 12 to 48 volts, so very, very easy and flexible to power the luminaires. This is the conceptually simplest solution. One processor inside, fiber optic cable on the fence, some cabling accessories to stitch the cable together. Interesting point here where to manage the gates, we will still, we will use that LM100, but purely in this case as a base station for the wireless gate sensor and the receiver. So this is an effective way to leverage two product solutions to, to give you the total coverage required. So uh, as you just mentioned, uh, we can deploy video analytics in a complementary fashion to the physical intrusion, uh, protect our physical security safeguards. And uh, the LM100 is uh, unique in the sense that it can provide lighting that's required by cameras in certain scenarios. So right now we're going to have a look at uh, outdoor people and vehicle tracking. This is uh, an analytic that is able to uh, discern and uh, determine, um, you know, movement within the field of view or within the scene of the camera. In this case, we have uh, a beautiful Canadian snowstorm like we often see in May. and um, of people moving, you know, within a parking lot. So this might be in the exterior of a distribution center. Uh, maybe you have uh, no-fly zones or areas where a personnel are not, not permitted or not permitted at certain times of day. Again, this analytic can be used uh, to detect and track an alarm and also uh, report historically within the system. As these individuals uh, move from being pedestrians and move into a vehicle, Again, we can acquire uh, that vehicle within the field of view, identify and classify it as a vehicle, and then we can track it uh, and as it move, an alarm on it as it moves within the scene. License plate recognition, another analytic that's often used uh, in outdoor scenarios. Uh, our license recognition analytic has the capability to identify uh, license plates and their different uh, you know, alphanumeric formats across multiple geographies in multiple regions. Each license plate is going to be acquired. Uh, it's going to be uh, captured in XML and it's going to be stored in our database. Some of our customers use the license plate recognition capability to uh, to integrate within their workflow, uh, you know, within a, a warehouse or distribution facility where perhaps you have um, trucks coming in with shipments and supplies, you want to route them to particular buildings or particular loading docks. Uh, we do have customers who have used the license plates recognition capability uh, in, with an integrated end-to-end -end workflow that way. So that brings us to the end of section three. And we do have another poll uh, that we'd like to share with you at the end of this uh, section. So I'm going to go ahead and try to set up that poll here. So Stuart, I'll obviously let you comment on the results of the poll. Uh, we're just over a minute here. We're just over 40% responses. I'll close it in a few seconds. Well, we have a clear winner. <laughs> really, it's all about the direct loss from the theft, the value of the goods being lost. 
followed up by maintaining a safe environment for employees. And avoiding delays in order servicing wasn't a strong uh, result. And I guess it's because there's lots of stuff to replace what gets taken away. So the customers will get their stuff on time anyway. Sure. Anyway, that's a good, that's, that's a very definitive and interesting response. So thank you all for, for responding. Next, next, this one, okay. So this one, I'll just hit the highlights on here. We've talked about integration a few times. Uh, the main point here being that we have a central integration focal point for integrating PIDs to VMS SMS PSIMs. You know, whether or not that's our own or whether or not that's third party, we use the network manager, so called network manager, as the integration focal point. And the benefits of that are if that if we have an integration to a third party, uh, then all the products are covered. So it's a common integration approach. And we can do integrations either through uh, API level, SDK level integrations, which many exist, but we also have more general purpose uh, outputs that can be used for integration purposes as well, such as ASCII text over TCP uh, IP, which many, many VMS systems uh, support. And as the ultimate fallback, we can trigger relays to, to, get, the into, to get the alarm in information into the, the control system. So I think that's really enough said on the integration question. Here's a selection of integrations that have been done. You'll see many of the well-known names there. There are others that, that aren't here, just because we picked some some that we like and are just that random. And there's many more being done uh, as, uh, at any time. So that's, that's that. This slide tells us the benefits of integrating PIDs with VMS and video analytics. And obviously, many of them are, are well known. You have an alarm, you need to know what cameras to pull up so that the operator has immediate accessibility to the information he needs and sees where things are happening. Um, the first point is an interesting point where if you have the pre-alarm ability built into the sensors, which Sensor does, uh, that, that's very, that goes a long way to helping PTZ cameras be effective. The challenge with PTZ cameras in terms of recording uh, intruder video is that they might not be looking in the right direction. But with the pre-alarm concept, it activates the PTZs and gives them a chance to get to the threat location before the, act, the, enter, the uh, intrusion event reaches the threshold conditions to act, fully declare an alarm. Um, so I think in interest of time, that's, that's the key point on that slide. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, so we're we're just going to wrap up with a, a few closing remarks. Um, hopefully, this has been of value today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, you know, it, it it goes without saying that warehouses, distribution, logistics centers have unique physical security requirements. Unfortunately, they are from time to time targeted, and they are suffering losses, as we can see from the headlines. If you're considering an investment in a safeguard or a mitigation set of technologies, um, always makes sense to consider in economic terms. And there is a methodology that we took from ISC squared, which uh, is one accepted way of the benefit of an investment. Uh, you know, the annual cost of the safeguard considered in light of the annual loss expectancy or the annualized loss expectancy. Um, the way that we chose to address this today is to look at solutions by their impact on the physical infrastructure of the site. And uh, hopefully you agree that there are solutions available that have uh, zero or next to, to no impact on that infrastructure. Then we look at ones that have more of a minimal impact and ones that are more moderate. And of course, they become more comprehensive as they become larger in scope. Uh, we would like to to take some time to take Q&A. All right. Uh, with a question we had from Ron, how can we secure the flex zone sensor cable on the wall, ceiling, et cetera? 
Yeah, fair question. So the answer is essentially you can treat the flexome cable the same way as you would treat um, a standard electrical cable. So you can use, you know, P clips, any kind of uh, small pipe uh, cable clips. It's very flexible. That really, that will not impact the performance in, in any way. Whatever way you choose to fix it to the wall is, is fine. Another flex zone question. Can we put the flex zone secure cable in the metal cable trunking running in the building? I would say yes, as long as that cable has good mechanical coupling to the walls or ceilings that are be that are to be protected. So I guess that's you know let's just leave it at that because it depends on the situation. But if if you know if a, if an impact to the wall or ceiling is going to vibrate that conduit, then the system will work. Okay. Are there any thermal options for monitoring temperature of associates or visitors as they enter? I mean, there there has been an announcement on the Safe Spaces uh, initiative from Sensor. So this is an area that of research and R and D. And look to us for uh, a, a suite of products coming forward. And I think if you go to sendstar.com, you can see the webinar scheduled for tomorrow and register for that. Okay, another question here. Does Sendstar support integration for existing lighting? Not at present in the sense of a, a packaged out-of-the-box integration, but by either doing a custom integration through an SDK that would be that would come from the lighting side or or using uh, uh, relays from our side into dry contact inputs on the lighting control side that would be a, a possible way of integrating just a couple more um, how long of a run can I do with LM100 each controller box that's a small gray box that I popped up a couple of times can manage up to 100 luminaires and the typical spacing of the luminaires on a fence is uh, two, two fence posts so about 20 feet so you can do approximately 2,000 feet of perimeter uh, with each LM100 processor and then of course you can chain the processors together um, as many as you need uh, to maintain a good robust wireless uh, mesh network communication you would like to have the luminaires within no luminaire should be more than 100 feet from the next one that's to, that it should be in communication with and normally that's there would be much closer together than that but that allows for you know one or even two luminaires to fail and the mesh network to heal and still have communications the powering of the luminaires is independent of the communication aspect so you can you can power the luminaires uh, from that chain of 100 from one controller could be powered from different sources along that chain depending on what the closest and most cost-effective way to power luminaires is. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple more here. Um, is it okay to place the flexone cable um, in a PVC conduit? Yes, yes. So that would be true in whether used for wall th breakthrough detection or, or on, that's probably the background to the question, but even if it were on the fence, you could do that still, yes. Okay, and then Kevin, this one will be for you. Can the facial recognition integrate into access control? Can it replace a physical card or device? Yeah, that's a great question, That and that's exactly where we're going. Um, we don't have any customers using it that way today. It's typically used as video verification, so a timestamp verification um, in conjunction with the access control system. Uh, but that's an integration that you can expect from us. Great. Okay, well, that is all the questions we have here today. Okay, well, thank you very much all for your attendance today. Uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the poll responses. Thank you, Kevin, for taking us through that. And uh, all stay tuned to the next uh, next um, sem e seminars coming up. Thanks once again, everyone, for your time today and your patience and your participation.